gentlemen. I am pain. Cenobites, those iconic figures from Clive Barker's 1986 novella The Hellbound Heart, are angels to some, demons to others. These beings hail from a hellish labyrinth under the rule of Leviathan, a deity of sorts. Barker crafted them as theologians of the Order of the Gash, devout followers of Leviathan. Leading this pack is the infamous Pinhead, also known as the Hell Priest. Cenobites pop up on Earth when there's a glitch in the space-time continuum, usually triggered by certain otherworldly objects. The most famous of these is the Lament Configuration, a puzzle box. Solve it and you've got yourself a one-way ticket to becoming a Cenobite. In this rundown, we're going to explore 29 of the most gruesomely fascinating Cenobites from the films. So, for all you followers of Leviathan, brace yourselves, as this video will blur the line between agony and ecstasy. Let's get started. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. I am the way. Pinhead. Pinhead, the fearsome priest of hell, is someone you just can't overlook. Even if you're not a Hellraiser fan, you got to admit, this guy is definitely in the big leagues of movie monsters. This iconic figure from the Hellraiser series has struck fear and fascination in equal measure. His inception by Clive Barker took place in some surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, mundane spots. Think American and European fetish clubs. But that wasn't all the inspiration. His design also draws from African mythology, particularly the Nkondi fetish dolls, known for their nail-studded bodies. Interestingly, Pinhead wasn't always Pinhead. In the first Hellraiser film, he was simply the lead Cenobite. It wasn't until Hell on Earth, the third movie, that Joey Summerskill christened him Pinhead, a name that stuck despite its late arrival. Shakespeare might have questioned the importance of a name, but in Pinhead's case, it encapsulates his terrifying essence perfectly. Pinhead's screen time in the films was usually brief yet impactful, clocking in around 10 to 15 minutes. But he took center stage in Hellraiser Judgment, where he defied God by manipulating the death of a serial killer, Sean. This act of rebellion didn't sit well with the Almighty, who punished Pinhead by stripping him of his powers and condemning him to live as a mere mortal, a fitting twist for someone who reveled in immortality and sadomasochism. The timeline of Pinhead's existence gets intriguing, especially when you consider Hellraiser 4 Bloodline, set in the year 2127. Here, he meets his end with the activation of the Elysium configuration, a device that eradicates the Cenobites, including Pinhead. This raises questions about the continuity between this film and the events of the tenth installment. Pinhead's backstory is as rich as it is dark. Before becoming the demonic entity, he was Captain Elliot Spencer, a man of compassion and empathy. The brutalities of World War I, particularly the Battle of Flanders, shattered his faith in humanity. His subsequent descent into hedonism led him to the Lament Configuration in British India, transforming him into Leviathan's favoured servant, a master of both pain and pleasure. As a Cenobite of the Order of the Gash, Pinhead's terrifying powers are symbolised by the pins in his head, believed to be placed by Leviathan himself. His character is unique in the franchise, appearing in all ten films, portrayed mostly by Doug Bradley, with Stephen Smith, Collins and Paul T. Taylor taking on the role in the later movies. Chatterer. Chatterer's backstory is one of the darker and grimmer ones when you compare it to other Cenobites, who usually met their fate because they were inherently evil or obsessed with pleasure. Chatterer was born as Jim to an abusive father who eventually killed the wife, after which young Jim was sent to an orphanage. Orphanages aren't usually a happy place, but Jim's was worse. He and his mates were taught that they were nothing more than society's scum, and that no one really cared about them. It wasn't before long that Jim developed a sexual relationship with another kid named Seth. But the closeness he received from Seth made him want more of the same, so he started praying to the god of love, seeking eternal affection and love. And yes, his prayers did kinda get answered, but they spelled doom for him. When Jim turned 16, he got involved in the flesh trade, where his clients would appreciate just how beautiful he was, but he didn't want their unyielding attention. One day, a client bizarrely asked him about his deepest desire. After some hesitation, Jim said he wished he was ugly, seeking escape from the constant attention his beauty brought. The client handed him a lament configuration, tasking him to distribute it as a servant of the god of pain and desire. Unbeknownst to Jim, this god was Leviathan. As he unknowingly served this dark deity, fate led him to a blind Seth. Their reunion didn't go as the Cenobites planned, with Seth leaving without opening the configuration. Curiosity got the better of Jim, and he opened it himself, turning into Chatterer, a Cenobite of horrifying appearance. He'd go on to become Pinhead's Enforcer. 
In the 1987 Hellraiser film, Chatterer's debut was memorable for his severely burned face, with only his mouth, horrifically held open by hooks, spared. The sequel toned down his burns, revealing more of his facial details. Regardless of his look, Chatterer's legacy is defined by the chattering sound of his teeth and his fearsome demeanor. He's unforgettable, especially in a scene where he aggressively restrains Kirsty, only releasing her at Pinhead's command, which shows his loyalty. Chatterer meets his end in the second film, killed by the Chenard Cenobite while heroically saving Kirsty on the female Cenobite's orders. But that wasn't the end of his story, as later films introduced Chatterer Beast, continuing the legacy of this iconic Cenobite. <laughs> Butterball. Laszlo's journey to becoming a Cenobite is a classic tale of excess leading to ruin. In his human life, he was the epitome of overindulgence, constantly chasing after more food and pleasure than he could handle. His gluttony and pursuit of sinful delights were his downfall. When he stumbled upon the lament configuration, he was captivated, thinking it was a ticket to fulfilling all his desires. However, solving the puzzle of the box turned his world upside down, inflicting immense pain and transforming him into a Cenobite, a member of Pinhead's notorious gash. Butterball's stint in the Hellraiser saga is as ghastly as it gets. This hefty Cenobite with his unsettling appearance first steps into the scenes alongside Pinhead, Female, and Chatterer. A year later, Butterball reappears when Dr. Chenard, driven by a hunger for knowledge, gets Tiffany to open the box. The Cenobites descend on the Mental Health Institute, reuniting with Kirsty. They lay down Hell's rules and send her off to navigate the labyrinth. Butterball's last stand comes when they try to turn Kirsty into one of their own, but her reminder of their human pasts stirs something in them. They end up defending Kirsty and Tiffany from the newly transformed Dr. Cenobite. Unfortunately for Butterball, he meets his end from a spear shot by the Doctor. As for Butterball's look, he's morbidly obese, with sunglasses embedded into his skin and eyes sewn shut. His stomach, grotesquely sliced open, is held by hooks. Dressed in black leather, like all Cenobites, his facial skin is disturbingly stretched, and his teeth appear unnervingly sharp, a detail particularly noticeable in Hellraiser 2, Hellbound. While he hasn't been seen since, his status as a high priest of Hell means Butterball could always make a horrifying comeback. Angelique. Angelique is basically a sinister blend of some good old-fashioned dark magic and diabolical transformation. Originally the demon princess of Hell and Leviathan's daughter, her journey began when Duke Delisle, an occultist, performed a dark ritual. He sacrificed a young woman and used the lament configuration to bridge Earth and Hell, summoning Angelique into the woman's barely damaged skin. After killing Delisle with Jacques, she becomes entangled in a power struggle, eventually murdering Jacques for resisting her plan to investigate Le Marchand's hair in New York. Arriving in New York, she discovers John Merchant's building, a potential super gateway to Hell. Years later, driven by her vendetta against the Le Marchand bloodline for attempting to counter the horrors unleashed by the Lament configuration, Angelique calls upon Pinhead for assistance, but she soon realizes Hell has changed. Pinhead turns Angelique into a Cenobite, binding her to his gash. Together, they go on a mission to halt the Le Marchand bloodline, a quest that ultimately proves futile as Paul Merchant, a descendant, manages to build the Elysium configuration, destroying Angelique and her Cenobite comrades. In the future, we see Angelique still trapped in her human form, re-emerge as a Cenobite after Paul Merchant releases her and her fellow Hell denizens. However, Merchant's invention, the Elysium configuration, becomes their undoing as it seals off the gateway to Hell, effectively ending their reign of terror. Angelique's Cenobite appearance is pretty fascinating and rightly chilling. She's bald, with her scalp bisected and pulled down by cables into her shoulders. Hooks dig into her chest and stomach. Her attire is a bit different from what Cenobites usually wear. She wears a revealing, sexualized leather dress that exposes her midriff and thighs, paired with elbow-length leather gloves. Female Cenobite, aka Deep Throat. Once a nun consumed by thoughts of sin and desire, she met a man who sensed her inner turmoil. He gifted her the Lament configuration. Opening the box, she summoned Grillard, a Cenobite, who whisked her away to Hell, where she indulged in her darkest fantasies of pain and pleasure. In Hell's twisted realm, she transformed and became the Cenobite known as Fallen. In her new life as a Cenobite, Nicoletta, now fallen, found herself paired with Pinhead, Hell's favored servant. She was transformed into a being that radiated ghastliness. Her head shaved, her nose pierced with a pin, and her throat pulled back by wires, giving her a raspy voice. Her appearance evolved over time, 
Initially, she had sunken features and a dark grey-blue skin tone, but later her look softened, appearing more human. She made her cinematic debut in 1987's Hellraiser, portrayed by Grace Kirby. The sequel, Hellbound Hellraiser 2, saw Barbie Wilde take up the role, giving her more screen time and a more humanized appearance. In the movie, she sided with Kirsty Cotton against the Chouinard Cenobite and ultimately sacrificed herself in the process. In the following years, her legacy continued, notably in a 1990 incident where she and Pinhead guided an artist, Davis Feldwebel, into creating macabre art, only to turn him into a painting themselves. Her story intertwined with the ongoing saga of the Lament Configuration, the gateway to hell, and the bloodline of its creator, Le Marchand. Ultimately, her fate, like her fellow Cenobites, was sealed when Paul Merchant activated the Elysium Configuration in 2127, closing the gateway to hell and ending their reign of terror. Dr. Chenard. Dr. Chenard's journey into the dark abyss of violence and mutilation began with a childhood fascination for dissecting animals, and it went on to define his future. He climbed the ranks to become a renowned neurologist and co-founder of the Chenard Institute, a haven for the mentally unstable. Yet, ironically, it was his own mind that brandished the deepest scars. His life became a relentless pursuit of the mysteries of hell, fed by an obsession with the puzzle boxes. Tiffany, a silent, puzzle-solving prodigy, caught Chenard's eye and became an unwitting pawn in his macabre game. The arrival of Kirsty Cotton with the Lament Configuration, the very box he sought, seemed to be the final piece in his diabolical plan. Using his knowledge, Chenard manipulated events to resurrect Julia Cotton, setting in motion a chain of events that would lead him to the labyrinth and into Leviathan's clutches. Upon coming out of the Creation Chamber, he was altered further by Leviathan, and he became a monstrous extension of Hell itself. His pursuit of Tiffany and Kirsty however, was thwarted by Pinhead and his gash, who chose to defy Hell to protect the girls. Chenard, now a formidable Cenobite, easily killed Pinhead's group but ultimately met his own death at the hands of Leviathan. In his human form, Chenard was the epitome of a 1930s 40s surgeon, composed, analytical, and often seen with a cigarette or a glass of neat whiskey. As a demon of Hell, he dressed in typical Cenobite leather, his blue skin peeking through circular cutouts in his outfit. His head was bound by wires, and an appendage from Leviathan connected to his skull, which resembled the surgical drills he once used. With the ability to unleash tentacles armed with blades and other eerie objects, Chenard Cenobite travelled a great path from a curious surgeon to a minion of Hell. Wire Twins The Wire Twins, Leviathan's crazy sister demons of delight, are a textbook example of what Cenobites represent, twisted pleasures. Originally human twins, their encounter with the labyrinth led to their eternal servitude in Hell's Domain, where they now revel in the sinister dance of pain and pleasure. True to their name, they're fixed with thin, sharp wires. Their Cenobite attire is scanty, with their abdomens held open by these wires. Baldness adds to their eerie aura, and instead of hair, they have wires that sprout from their scalps. Their eyes are slit open in a perpetual gaze of torment, but it's not just their looks that evoke fear and fascination. The Wire Twins' tongues are long, black, and snake-like, tools of both pleasure and pain. They use these tongues in ways that blur the lines between ecstasy and agony, engaging in acts like fellatio, cunnilingus, and analingus. Even their chins are bound to the collars of their bras by wires. Each twin bears a unique symbol carved into their skin. One sports a sickle with two dots, while the other symbol is a larger sickle intersected by a line. In demeanor, the wire twins embody the essence of the Cenobite sadomasochistic ethos, with a heightened focus on the carnal aspects of pain and pleasure. Their libidinous nature sets them apart, even among their fellow Cenobites. Pseudo-Cenobites the pseudo Cenobites from Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth are a unique breed, created by Pinhead on Earth rather than in the depths of Hell, which is why they're not true Cenobites and are called pseudo Cenobites. Here's the rundown on these earthly made horrors. Bobby. In the movie, Pinhead splits into two entities, of which one gets trapped in the Pillar of Souls. The pillar later ends up in J.P. Monroe's Boiler Room Club and becomes the catalyst for the transformation of several characters into Cenobites, including bartender Richard Bloodstone. Pinhead, on a rampage, wraps Richard's head in barbed wire, blinding him. As Barbie, he wields a fiery breath and Molotov cocktails, but his appearance in the franchise ends with the third film. Camera Head. So, Camera Head was this guy who originally worked as a cameraman for Joey, the lead character in the third Hellraiser film. 
Joey, a local news reporter, was digging into some pretty eerie stuff happening at the Boiler Room Club. She asks Camerahead to meet her there. He gets there first and ends up being transformed into a Cenobite by Pinhead. Later, we find that Joey is on the run with the Lament configuration, and Pinhead sends Camerahead and others after her. The cool and creepy part about Camerahead is that he's got a camera jammed into his right eye and a film roll where his ear should be. Anything he films can be blown up with his mind. Plus, his camera can transform into a weapon to slash and impale victims. Interestingly, Cenobites usually lose their past memories after their transformation, but pseudo-Cenobites like Camerahead seem to keep theirs. CD Head Jimmy Hammerstein was the unlucky DJ at the Boiler Room Club. Before his gruesome transformation, Jimmy seemed like a decent guy. We get a glimpse of his polite demeanor in a brief chat with Joey about Terry, Monroe's ex-girlfriend. But then Pinhead shows up and, well, things go south for Jimmy. Pinhead, being the creative demon he is, decides to impale Jimmy's skull with five CDs, turning him into a walking horror show, albeit a musical one. Pinhead places these CDs, one in each of Jimmy's eyes and one in his mouth. The result is that Jimmy is now left blind and mute. CD Head uses them like shurikens, throwing them to impale his victims. In the movie, Jimmy's human form and his Cenobite form are played by different actors. Brent Bolthouse plays the human Jimmy, while Eric Wilhelm takes on the role of the Cenobite CD Head. Rima. She started as Terry, a down-on-her-luck girl who hung out at the Boiler Room Club. Terry's life was tough, often being taken advantage of, which fueled her desire for power and control. She found herself making a deal with Pinhead, leading her down a dark path. Terry's transformation into a pseudo-Cenobite gave her a twisted kind of freedom. She could dream endlessly, experiencing everything she couldn't have in real life. This was her twisted version of heaven and hell rolled into one. Pinhead once said that Cenobites are angels to some and demons to others, and Terry's story really embodies that idea. Unlike most Cenobites, Terry is the dreamer Cenobite, could remember her past and even talk more than the others. Her love story with Monroe is actually what led to her tragic fate, both as a human and a Cenobite. They were apparently in love, but when push came to shove, they turned against each other. It's a stark contrast to other Cenobite couples like Pinhead and Makova or Alastor and Chalkis. In the film's climax, Terry manages to open the Lament configuration, which sends all the pseudo-Cenobites, including herself, back to hell. Piston Head So, as I've already established, Monroe was this guy who made a shady deal with Pinhead. Pinhead was trapped in a pillar and needed to off some people to break free. Monroe was like, sure, I'll help, and started feeding Pinhead unsuspecting victims from his club. But when it was time for the final kill, Monroe decided to throw Terry under the bus. Big mistake. She fought back, overpowered Monroe, and struck her own deal with Pinhead. The deal Terry offered was, take Monroe, not me. And Pinhead was like, okay, deal. That's how Monroe became Pistonhead. Pinhead, living up to his name, jammed two pistons into Monroe's skull, hence the name. Piston Head. In every scene Piston Head is in, these pistons are constantly moving. It's, uh, it's pretty gross to watch, honestly. Monroe's story is a classic case of betrayal backfiring big time. <laughs> Siamese Twins Mark and Michael Bradley were two brothers who got way more than they bargained for. They were gearing up to be security guards working for John Merchant, a descendant of Le Marchan. The night before the big opening of the building they were protecting, they heard some noises and decided to investigate. They stumble upon a private chit-chat between the Cenobites, Angelique and Pinhead. Pinhead, being Pinhead, senses that these brothers were always scared of being apart. So, what does he do? He goes full Pinhead and fuses their bodies together, then sends them off to hell for some extra tweaking by the engineer. In 2127, in space, they show up again. This time, Dr. Paul Mushin accidentally sets them free, along with Angelique, Chatterer Beast, and Pinhead. Here, the twins absorb Captain Edwards into their conjoined bodies. In the end, though, they, along with the other Cenobites, meet their death. Dr. Mushin tricks them and activates the Elysium configuration. And just like that, the Siamese twins, along with Pinhead and Angelique, are history, and the door to hell gets slammed shut. <laughs> Torso. Torso is definitely one of the most dramatically transformed characters in the Hellraiser movies. Created by the Chatterer, Torso is like a tribute to him. After the Chatterer's supposed downfall, Torso's been roaming the labyrinth, looking for his maker. He's part of Pinhead's crew, known as Pinhead's Gash, 
and they've got a particularly nasty gig torturing this soul named Joseph Thorne, stuck in a kind of no man's land between Earth and Hell. Torso is basically a living homage to the Chatterer. You can barely see any of his facial features except for his mouth, which is stretched wide open with hooked chains. He's got these tiny squinty eyes, but they're mostly hidden. His face is twisted and mutilated, kind of resembling the Chatterer's burn scars. True to his name, Torso's missing everything below the waist. Just a section of his spine sticks out where the lower half used to be. Chatterer Beast. The Chatterer Beast is a monstrous hound, but made entirely out of human flesh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's as gnarly as it sounds. This beast is fashioned in the likeness of the Chatterer Cenobite and is the first among several Chatterer-inspired creatures. So, the Chatterer Beast is basically Pinhead's pet in the movie. Interestingly, it's been made from the flesh of those who have been tortured. There's this one scene where Pinhead feeds it a live pigeon, which is strange because Cenobites are known not to hurt innocents. Later, it stalks the wife of John Merchant. Once again, the Chatterer Beast also meets its end through the Elysium configuration. In the end, John Merchant blows up the Elysium configuration and with it, the Chatterer Beast is taken out, closing the door to hell in the process. Definitely a wild ride for a pet made of human flesh. Surgeon. Deacon Vranian from Hellraiser Hellseeker was this top-notch surgeon, famous and respected. But things took a tragic turn when he accidentally killed his wife during surgery. That event shattered everything for him. His reputation, his sanity, the works. After his wife's death, Deacon was desperate to block out the world. His answer came in the form of the Lament configuration. He solved it and naturally Pinhead shows up, offering him a way to forget his pain. Deacon jumps at the offer with no second thoughts. In Hellraiser Hellseeker, Deacon pops up in a nightmare of Kirsty's husband Trevor doing what he does best, operating, but this time on Trevor himself. As for his Cenobite days, Deacon, now known as the Surgeon, was part of the gang when Kirsty opened the Lament configuration for the third time and walked into Hell. She strikes a deal with Pinhead, five souls in exchange for hers. Pinhead's game and the Surgeon, alongside other Cenobites like Bound, Stitch and Chatterer 3, wait for Kirsty to deliver. The Surgeon and Bound get the first task. They go after one of Trevor's affairs and smother her with Saran Wrap. Trevor later sees this for himself after he's dead and stuck in limbo, his eternal punishment for crossing the order. Pseudo Pinhead. Pseudo Pinhead's story started when he was Stephen Craven, just a regular dude until a trip to Mexico led him to open the Lament configuration. After opening the box, Stephen's life takes a turn for the worse. He gets tortured and then, to add insult to injury, is transformed into a Cenobite. That's how Pseudo Pinhead comes into the picture. Essentially, he's a raw, less polished version of the infamous Pinhead, more like an unintentional parody. In reality, his skin is held together by nails. Pseudo Pinhead was actually created to help capture Nico Bradley, Steve's former friend. Turns out, Nico had also managed to escape hell, pulling a Frank Cotton move. So, Stephen, now Pseudo Pinhead, gets the task of bringing his old buddy back to where he belongs in hell. The Engineer. This character is something else entirely. Believed to have been human innumerable years ago, he could be one of the first to accidentally open Hell's gates. In 1991, a woman named Glenda cracks open the Heart of Damnation puzzle, and who shows up? The Engineer. Along with a crew of Cenobites including Saucy Jack, Bright Eyes, The Voice, and Butterball. When Glenda's colleague Hank tries to get rid of them by stabbing the puzzle, it just ticks off Saucy Jack. The outcome is not great for Glenda and Hank. In the overall Hellraiser timeline, Kirsty opens the lament configuration, which leads her to the labyrinth. She hears a baby crying, follows the sound, and boom, she's face to face with the engineer. This thing chases her through the labyrinth, but Kirsty's quick. She solves the box again, closing the labyrinth and bringing in Pinhead's gash. Later, after Kirsty deals with Frank and sends Pinhead and his crew back to hell, the engineer pops out of a closet for a final showdown over the box. Once again, Kirsty wins, solving the box and sending the engineer back to hell in a blaze. In Clive Barker's original vision, the engineer is described with a head like a cone of white fire. This creature also crafted the Cenobite's torture devices. Appearance-wise, the engineer is a mix of scales and human skin with, with amber cat-like eyes, a scorpion-like tail, and a mouthful of teeth. It moves upside down, hanging from its back feet on the labyrinth's walls. Its limbs end in hand-like appendages, and it might even have bladed tentacles, though that part's a bit unclear. The Gasp. Before becoming a Cenobite, it's hinted that she might have had a rough life or dark desires. Eventually, she stumbles upon the configuration box, solves it, only to be tortured, mutilated and turned into a Cenobite under Pinhead's command. In Hellraiser, 
The gasp pops up when Riley McKendry narrowly escapes being marked by the box's blade. Pinhead tells Riley to find another soul in exchange for her life. We meet Serena Menneker, who accidentally opens the box and pierces herself. When she meets the gasp and the gang, pleading for mercy, the gasp sticks the needle down Serena's throat, saying, Save your breath for screaming. Of course, Serena's fate was sealed. Later, when Riley refuses to give Pinhead more souls, the Gasp joins the Cenobites in going after Riley and her friends. They end up at Roland Voigt's mansion, where the Gasp taunts Riley about her brother Matt, whom Pinhead had released. The Gasp's personality is classic Cenobite, vile, sadistic, and all about torture. While Pinhead is more of an intellectual type, the Gasp is a straight-up perverted sadist, relishing in causing and experiencing pain. As far as her powers are concerned, she's immune to pain, thanks to the endless torture she once suffered. But she's not invincible. She can be harmed by the blades from the configuration box and certain objects from the labyrinth. The Asphyx. The Asphyx from the latest Hellraiser movie is a seriously gruesome Cenobite, at least as far as her appearance is concerned. The Cenobite's own skin, flayed and stripped away, is then used to smother its face. This skin is held in place, gruesomely pinned along nerves and muscles, making for a pretty horrific sight. With its chest exposed and heaving, the Asphyx is in a constant struggle to breathe, trapped by its own disfigured skin. Initially, the Asphyx is bound up with wires that force its hands into a prayer-like position. This setup is attached to both its front and back. In classic Cenobite fashion, it's mostly skinless. Despite its terrifying look, the Asphyx starts off pretty calm, almost giving off a vibe of some twisted religious ceremony. But once its hands are released from their bound state, the real threat of the Asphyx becomes glaringly apparent. The Mask The Mask is a nod to one of the most iconic deaths in the original movie. Remember Frank's Jesus Wept scene? This Cenobite's face is stretched and twisted over a surgical wire wrapped around its head. The mask's skin is pale, almost white, dissected and displayed like something you'd see in a medical textbook. It's got these two strips of skin on its chest, each inscribed with text that echoes the ancient religious themes you find all over the Hellraiser series. And then there are the wires and pins which help in holding most of its body together. The design is reminiscent of old-school surgical illustrations. Stitch. She's summoned along with Pinhead and other Cenobites when Kirsty opens the Lament configuration for the second time. Kirsty's husband Trevor was plotting to swipe her inheritance from Frank and Larry Cotton, and he gifts her the box as part of his scheme. But before Stitch and the gang could really dive into tormenting Kirsty, she strikes a deal with Pinhead. Stitch has a pretty horrific way of making her presence felt. At one point, she enters Trevor's limbo as one of his mistresses. As they kiss, she reveals her proper form and straps a metal mask to his mouth, driving a screw right through his head. Stitch makes another appearance in Hellraiser Deader, where she's evolved. Her deformities have lessened, and she's alongside Pinhead and others, dealing with the Deaders and their leader, Winter. Despite their efforts, the bloodline hasn't ended. When Amy, the only survivor, kills herself, Pinhead's plan fails, and Stitch, along with the rest of Pinhead's gash, disappears as the Lament configuration explodes, sending them all back to Hell. Stitch's fate remains uncertain, though. As for her look, Stitch is a sight to behold, or maybe not so much. She's got pale white skin, her face burned and peeled off her skull, then stapled back in reverse. Her eyes and mouth are sewn shut, making her blind, deaf, and mute. Her belt, holding bloody knives, is made from her own intestines, and she wears a slightly more revealing version of the classic leather Cenobite suit. Little sister. Back when she was human, she had it all. Beauty, brains, and everything she could want. But there was still something missing, a kind of obsession she couldn't shake off. Her search for whatever was lacking led her to the Lament configuration. The moment she found it, she knew it was the missing piece in her life. As a Cenobite, Little Sister was a newbie, but she quickly caught Leviathan's eye. She had this mix of sexuality and a sort of degraded vibe that made her perfect for luring souls to Leviathan. A big moment came when Amy Klein opened the box. Little Sister and the rest of Pinhead's crew were all over it, especially since Amy was mixed up with the Deaders, a group messing with the natural order of things. Plus, their leader, Winter, was from the Le Marchand bloodline, which was a bonus for them. Little Sister first appeared to Amy as a hallucination on a train, sitting among the bodies of dead Deaders. But after Amy called the Cenobites, leading to the end of winter and the remaining Deaders, Little Sister and the gang started to close in on Amy. However, Amy's suicide meant a failed mission for the Cenobites, sending them all back to hell. Little Sister, along with Stitch, Bound and Spike, 
weren't seen or heard from again, leaving her fate up in the air. Little sister is something out of a nightmare. She's got ten wires slicing down her face, five on each side, cutting into her flesh and eyelids, blinding her. These wires connect to a metal bar where her nose should be. Her head is marked with crescent-shaped cuts, and she's missing her nose and ears. Female Cenobite 2, Chatterer 4. Chatterer 4, along with Pinhead and Pseudo Pinhead, brought back Nico Bradley after his escape from hell. Her last known action was assisting in taking Sarah Craven to hell, and what happened to her after that is a mystery. As for her look, Chatterer 4 is a unique spin on the original Chatterer design. She's the fourth iteration after Chatterer 2, Chatterer 3, and Torso. Leviath, a big fan of the Chatterer style, ensured that this design ensured that this design lived on in later Cenobites. Chatterer 4's face is quite similar to Chatterer 3, but she's got what looks like hair made of wires, a design element earlier seen in the case of the Wire Twins. On the sides of her head, you'll find various tattoos, though their significance remains a puzzle. Her outfit is classic Cenobite, leather with some metal elements, all stitched together in a kind of haphazard fashion. Take me like you took them! The Weeper. The Weeper is one of the most unique Cenobites in the new wave of Cenobites from the latest Hellraiser movie. She's got this deep blue skin and massive black eyes that are always dripping with black tears, giving her an almost alien look. Yet, yeah, it's her continuous sobbing that adds a chilling yet human touch to her otherwise inhuman look. Her body is a canvas of horror. Ribbons of her own flesh have been peeled away and wound onto spools that are gruesomely attached to her skin. To add to this, part of her lower lip and chin are missing, revealing the raw flesh underneath. The Weeper's abilities are just as unsettling. She can split her arms open, revealing a second pair of arms held together by surgical pins. It's no exaggeration to say that the Weeper is one of the most disturbing and visually horrific additions to the Cenobite ranks, especially under the leadership of the new Pinhead. Bound. Her past is a bit of a mystery, though rumors suggest she was married to a homicidal maniac. As a Cenobite, Bound's role in Pinhead's gash was relatively minor but significant. She was part of the crew when Kirsty made that deal with Pinhead to trade five souls instead of her own. Bound played her part in reaping these souls including Kirsty's unfaithful husband, Trevor. Appearance-wise, she's got these tight leather straps covering her eyes and mouth, blinding and choking her. Metal wires wrap around her head, slicing open her skin and securing the straps. On top of her head is a nail crown that stretches open her scalp. <laughs> Bound 2. Now, Bound 2 is the male counterpart of Bound. He's seen in the traditional black leather costume similar to Pinhead's. He first shows up when Amy Klein is about to give in to Winter and the Deaders. Amy solves the lament configuration instead, summoning Bound 2, Pinhead, and others. When Amy refuses to surrender her soul and kills herself, the lament configuration explodes, sending Bound 2 and the rest back to hell. He appears as a hallucination to a group of Hellraiser fans who were drugged at a themed party. In these visions, Bound 2 is part of the terrifying experiences the partygoers endure. The story takes another twist when Adam's father, seeking revenge for his son's death, gets involved with the lament configuration. He summons Pinhead, Chatterer 3, and Bound 2. Pinhead reveals that the host should have been his target long ago, and orders Bound 2 and Chatterer 3 to use their pendulum-like weapons on him. The Mother The Mother is an intriguing but, once again, a disturbing addition. We only get a brief look at her, but she's set up to be a memorable Cenobite in future movies, hopefully outshining some of the past sequels. Her design is pretty darn unsettling, with a body dissected in a way that emphasizes a grotesque pregnancy. The way she cradles her stomach reminds us of the crying baby from Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, which is essentially a play on the twisted maternal theme. The mother's look is enhanced by the classic Hellraiser blue-tinged lighting. When this lighting hits a headscarf, it evokes imagery of Mary, which merges maternal and religious themes. Interestingly, an illustration of the mother is also spotted on the wall in Voight's office, alongside images of the Gasp and the Weeper, further hinting at her importance and future role in the Hellraiser lore. The blade would have taken them! Does it matter? The Cenobites will come. Just like I Roland Voigt. Voigt's transformation into a Cenobite is quite a story. He's unique because we actually know his human backstory, something rare for Cenobites, especially since Doug Bradley's pinhead backstory isn't considered canon anymore. Voigt's journey to Cenobite Hood starts when he opens the Lament configuration. He's then offered the power of the Cenobites, but not without a price. 
Voigt endures severe torture until he becomes a new Cenobite. His mouth gets ripped open and peeled back, exposing his teeth in a chatterer-like fashion, while the rest of his flesh is sliced and pinned back. The reveal of Voigt's transformation teases the possibility of a sequel, but also plays heavily into the movie's pseudo-Christian themes. This scene is intense. With Voigt's mutilation set against a backdrop of angelic choral music and enveloped in bright white light. Marvelous Verdict, the Hellraiser series has done a stellar job of growing its lore and legacy, all while staying true to the vibe of the original. The new Cenobites are a cool mix of homage to the franchise's earlier demons and a nod to a more medical, anatomical aesthetic. What's really impressive is how these new characters bring back the unique blend of horror and beauty seen in the original Cenobites. Despite their gruesome deformities, there's this sense of elegance and artistry about them that's just quintessentially Hellraiser. But that's just me. What do you think? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Endgame Demon. No!